So it's the plot here itself. Yeah, I think well so. That is uh that camera is gonna get that's a king. <laughs> it's fine. Um Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor uh, Andrew Walder from Stanford, uh, who's joining us in Canberra this week for a, a number of events, including our inaugural uh, ANU China in the World Forum, which was held uh, here on Tuesday. And uh, we're very excited uh, to have what appears to be a very early sneak preview of uh, Professor Walder's new book on the Civil War in Guanxi. Uh, I think Professor Walder is well known to everyone here, um, so I won't make an elaborate uh, introduction, uh, but I would like you to all please uh, join me in uh, loudly in welcoming um, Andrew Walder here today. Among other things, Professor Walder is on the editorial board of the China Journal, uh, which I'm editor and which I'm proud to say is uh, still the number one ranked China studies journal in the world. And I'm very also uh, very delighted to uh, welcome uh, my predecessors, uh, editors for a long time of the China Journal, John Unger and Anita Chan, and also um, distinguished guest, Jean Oi uh, from Stanford, uh, also visiting this week and participating in a number of events. So welcome everyone. And on that note, I'll hand over to you, Eddie. Thank you, Ben, for that introduction. It's always a pleasure to uh, come to the home of the Australian Journal of Chinese Affairs slash China Journal. Um, um, John and Anita invited us here 30 years ago, uh, and so I guess we did all right because <laughs> even <laughs> it only took 30 years to invite us back. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about what I believe will be the last thing that I publish on the China, uh, on the Cultural Revolution. I've, I kind of got stuck. Um, this is, I think, the fourth book that I've, I've worked on. It turns out that the documentation on this period is actually uh, much more, much more rich than it was um, when I first became interested in the Cultural Revolution, which was in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so let me just introduce this topic. Um, Guangxi has long had a reputation uh, as the most violent region in the early years of the Cultural Revolution, in particular 1967 and 1968. Uh, published reports in the 1990s by authors like Zheng Yi and Donald Sutton, uh, which were based on leaks from internal Communist Party investigations, described gruesome massacres of non-combatants in villages the eradication of entire households, sexual violence, and even cannibalism in some cases, and unusually high casualty counts. These reports found their way into published local annals, including gruesome details of village massacres. And so the published annals from Guangxi province are among the most detailed uh, about the um, events of that period. Internal investigations carried out by the Central Committee of the Communist Party indicate a minimum of around 100,000 people who were killed uh, primarily in 1968. Uh, this implies a death rate of around four per thousand, <clears throat> which is roughly double the estimate for the rest of China. So, um, and so we've known about events in Guangxi for a long period of time, uh, and there are, are plenty of, of, uh, of descriptive accounts um, uh, documenting what happened during this period. But it's only, only recently that scholars have turned to the question of why Guangxi was so much more violent than other parts of China during this period. The first <clears throat> kind of explanation is about the nature of the political conflicts. What, what was the fighting about? What, were the, what, were the factional, uh, what was the factional warfare motivated by? And second, uh, a second kind of explanation is about the distinctive features of Guangxi province itself. Um, one point of view um, is that the conflict between the two factions, these are province-wide factions, one called the Allied Command, the second, April 22nd, uh, was akin to a kind of 
class struggle. Um, Hualin Shan, uh, who wrote about, who's from Guangxi and wrote about the uh, culture revolution in Guangxi, Yang Jishang and his long awaited uh, book on the culture revolution adopts this point of view. Uh, and that is that the allied command faction represented a bureaucratic clique, that's um, Yang Jishang's turn, turn uh, which, was, which was defending the, their power and privilege. These included military officers, ranking officials, and party members. On the other side was April 22nd, who were anti-establishment insurgents who wanted to challenge the status quo. And so from this point of view, the overwhelming violence applied at the end of this period by the Allied command uh, after Beijing's July 3rd orders called for the ruthless suppression of continuing uh, factional violence illustrated the lengths to which the privileged and the powerful would go to defend their interests and defend the system that uh, enshrined their privileges. A very different uh, argument is by my uh, student, former student, uh, Su Yang, Yang Su, who teaches at UC um, Irvine. He points out the, the anomalous fact that almost all of the deaths occurred in rural regions and in villages where factional conflicts appeared to be absent. He, he, um, he uh, based his argument on the, the published annals, and he pointed out that only 15% of the deaths recorded in Guangxi were actually from factional battles, and almost all the deaths uh, uh, from factional battles were in the cities. Uh, victims in the villages, he, he, he reasoned, the remaining 85% were members of households stigmatized as bad elements by the regime, uh, and that the killers in the villages were ordinary men, residents of the same villages, not agents of the state. And if you read the descriptions of, of <clears throat> the horrific way in which many people were killed, they would seem to indicate that there were um, uh, uh, local hatreds, intergroup hatreds. So he, uh, he framed um, the framing, he argued, of the April faction as an anti-communist conspiracy uh, of class enemies, uh, he argues, launched unintended attacks on stigmatized households by ordinary citizens and villages against people who had long been stigmatized as former landlords, nationalists, and so forth. And so uh, Suyang drew parallels with genocidal intergroup conflict uh, in Rwanda, Bosnia, and partition era India. And so his book, which won awards from the American Sociological Association uh, and others, um, drew, uh, basically saw this um, as um, an extension of the literature on genocide. Sort of um, you know, what, what happened in these localities mimicked the genocidal intergroup violence that you saw in other settings. Um, with regard to the distinctive features of Guangxi, uh, that's another kind of explanation. One argument is that this is uh, basically an expression of regional backwardness. Uh, Guangxi had very low levels of urbanization and education. Um, it was overwhelmingly agricultural. Uh, and in many, many uh, accounts, reports of gruesome massacres, especially cannibalism, suggested a kind of cultural backwardness as an important cause of the violence. Another argument, and this is something that Su Yang argued, uh, was that the remoteness of many rural communities um, and due to the mountainous topography and poorly accessible rural regions permitted these killings by ordinary residents to spin out of control of the authorities. Uh, and he's right to point out that the authorities never mandated massacres of people from bad class backgrounds. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, they tried unsuccessfully to halt them when they were underway. Um, so Remoteness for Su Yang um, uh, indicates that these killings spun out of control of the authorities. Uh, two other obvious features of Guangxi is the ethnic composition. One third of Guangxi's population were non Han ethnic minorities, mostly Zhuang. Uh, the Zhuang are China's largest ethnic minority. Almost all of them live in Guangxi. So the, the question, no one's really argued this, but we need to ask the question of whether violence was intensified by ethnic antagonism uh, in mixed, ethnically mixed regions. The second variety of this is sub-ethnic antagonisms, and this is pushed really hard by Su Yang in his book. Uh, his book actually was about both Guangdong and Guangxi province, but he emphasizes the presence in the region of the Hakka people, which is a sub 
uh, Han uh, ethnicity, uh, who were late Han migrants into the South with a distinctive dialect, a distinctive culture. They had a history of blood feuds with earlier Han settlers over land and water rights, the Hakka Bundi Wars in neighboring Guangdong in the 19th century are estimated to have killed close to a million people in the 19th century. So Su Yang point, uh, points out a Hakka tradition of militant self-defense that was activated by conflict in this region, making the violence when it did break out uh, even more severe. Now, um, the sources for this book, these are the questions uh, that I, I'm investigating in this book, Prior research was based on published local annals, including all of my previous work, my previous work in collaboration with Su Yang, he was a student uh, at Stanford. They were highly revealing and much more detailed for Guangxi than in other regions. But this study is based on the entire set of internal investigation reports from the early 1960s, ordered by the CCP Central Committee under Hu Yaobang. Uh, they contain detailed chronologies of events in each of the 80 counties and six cities, also provincial departments and agencies. There's abundant narrative and statistical detail at each level, including the identities of victims and perpetrators. The published annals describe around 450 total political events during this period. The investigation reports uh, uh, detail more than 4,500, so give you a sense of the additional, and this is what these, these volumes look like. They are published books ranging from 300 to 800 pages in blue plastic covers. I have no idea how many of these were, were published, but my guess is there's a couple thousand that were distributed to officials throughout Guangxi uh, and in other parts of China. Um, so how to process this enormous mass of material? Well, it helps to be in a shutdown during a COVID epidemic and you can't you can't go anywhere. So this was the only. Uh, it's not not the not the most exciting or uh, pleasant way uh, to to um, endure a lockdown. But um, the, there are two two ways of uh, I, I've tried to process the material. First is to focus on the sum. Uh, try to get a summary overview of political narratives across the six cities and 80 counties and reconstruct the formation of factions and political conflict over time. And the second and the harder part is to extract data about the timing and features of more of these more than 4,500 political events and related death counts and code them into a database. And this took a couple, two, three years uh, with support from the National Science Foundation. Um, and, and finally, uh, to, to link these events, the data about these events, uh, with data about cities and counties where the events occurred, for example, the population mix, urbanization, number of party members, number of state cadres, distance from political centers, and so forth, to try to get a sense of what regions within Guangxi had the, had the highest death rates. And so this, um, unfortunately won't be ready for Christmas, but this will be available in March of next year. The main findings, let me just scroll through the main findings. Uh, and in about half an hour, the half an hour or so left to me, um, I'll get into some of the details. Um, first of all, factional conflict was not irrelevant. According to Su Yang, the factional conf conflict really didn't explain what happened in villages because it was restricted uh, to urban areas. Uh, but um, uh, what's revealed in his materials is that factional conflict was highly relevant, but its nature was very different from the way that Yang Jisheng and Hua Lin Shan and others have uh, described it. It was not a struggle between the privileged and the powerful versus insurgents, but a split in the civilian power structure at all levels. Okay? Uh, it also was, to some extent, uh, a split in the military uh, military units that were in Guangxi, with the uh, with the uh, regional uh, regional military offices uh, uh, on the side of the Allied command, but very often the PLA combat units that were placed uh, in Guangxi often supported April twenty second. Um, the Allied command was aligned with military district forces, the county people's armed departments and in villages with people's militia. Uh, the massacres that were carried out in 1968 were carried out by village militia. 
yes, they did live in the villages, but they were linked to the military hierarchy and were under orders. Uh, so um, about Huang Shi's distinctiveness, the local death rates, as it turns out, were not affected by the presence of non-Han minorities or Hakka. Ethnically diverse localities did not have higher death rates. Now, in the question and answer period, uh, we, we can raise this question further. This does not mean that there was no ethnic conflict. It just means that areas where there were mixed populations didn't have higher death rates than other regions. Okay. Remoteness, as it turned out, whether conceived as political or geographic, did not intensify the violence, but insulated regions from the worst. The most important feature, however, uh, which is not mentioned in any of the previous work, and which I had never even thought about, was that the Vietnam War was being fought on Wang Xi's border, and this was the height of U.S. military escalation. <clears throat> this shaped Beijing's interventions in Wang Xi, forming factional divisions and making them more difficult to resolve. And so here is the map that shows you how close uh, Wang Xi is. Uh, in 1966 and 67, the Americans began to bomb all in here. Um, and um, the Gulf of Tonkin is here. The Gulf of Tonkin incident, many of you may recall, was a major reason uh, for the approval of mil sending military forces to Vietnam. There was a train line that ran from Hunan to Guilin, through Liuzhou, through Nanning, and into Vietnam through Pingshan, where most of the support personnel and material uh, went down to support the Vietnamese. Um, there's constant mentions in Beijing's communication with the, with the factions in Guangxi uh, about the necessity to keep that railway line open. It's very easy to shut down a railway line and shut down repeatedly during this period. That was a reason why Beijing paid very, very close attention to what was happening in Guangxi from the very beginning. Now, uh, Beijing was highly attentive to the U.S. escalation in Vietnam uh, and to events in Guangxi. Uh, Beijing had already moved PLA combat and Air Force units into Guangxi in 1964 and 1965, and they were stationed throughout the province. Uh, but they, uh, they constantly were pleading to, uh, pleading, uh, to the two rebel factions to reconcile their differences. Uh, and when they did so, they emphasized Wang Xi's position at the front lines uh, of the anti-imperialist struggle. Rebel leaders called, were called to Beijing uh, for negotiations throughout 1967, and Viet, the Vietnam War was a key talking point. So Beijing was very, very concerned about what was happening there. The final suppression orders of July 3rd, 1968, which unleashed this wave of violence, emphasized the importance of support for Vietnam. That, that this fighting has to stop. And that's what really unleashed, um, unleashed most, of, uh, most of the killing. Now, um, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna try to go through the political narrative as quickly as possible and kind of give you a sense of how the factional fighting uh, developed. And then I'm gonna move to some of the statistical results that, that speak to the questions that uh, I stated at the beginning. So, um, in late 1966, uh, a fellow named Wei Guoqing, a PLA veteran, who uh, had been Guangxi's party secretary for about 10 years, became the target of all the rebel factions in Guangxi. On January 23rd, a rebel power seizure overthrew the provincial government, provincial party committee, um, and there was administrative chaos after that. Rebel groups split into two different factions, started to fight in the streets. Uh, in late March, uh, military control was imposed. This happened was uh, imposed. This happened all over China when uh, power seizures failed to establish uh, new governments, and the armed forces were to substitute for collapsed civilian governments. But the big surprise was that Wei Guoqing was he would already been thrown out of power was appointed to head the military control forces. Wei Guoqing was the only long-standing provincial leader to retain his position. This went totally against the thrust of the Cultural Revolution up to that point in time. Uh, he was the only one. So why? Well, it turns out it's directly related to the war across the border. Wei Guoqing had been the head of the military support group to Vietnam in the early 1950s. He spent five years there. 
with Ho Chi Minh and the other, other leaders of what was then called the Viet Minh. Uh, he devised the strategy, apparently, that defeated the French forces at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Uh, he was the top official in Guangxi from 1955, uh, and he apparently was appointed there as a sign of, of China's uh, close ties with the Vietnam leadership. Uh, China, at this point in time, 66, 67, 68, uh, this is after the Sino-Soviet split, they were urging Vietnam to fight on to victory and not negotiate in Paris, as the USSR was suggesting. And Guangxi was the staging area for the shipment of arms and personnel into Vietnam. So after Mao, you could argue that Wei Guoqing was arguably the only other Chinese hero of the anti-imperialist global struggle. Um, so the, the formation of the April 22nd faction actually was a creation of younger radicals uh, and somewhat older radicals like Zhang Chunqiao and Yao Wenyuan and Zhang Qing and so forth, um, uh, who, who objected to the retention of this old revisionist, Wei Fo Qing. I mean, what was the difference? Why was he different from all of the other PLA heroes who had fought in the Civil War? Um, so radical members of the Central Cultural Revolution Group opposed his appointment, and they had a representative in Guangxi, in Nanning, that organized an opposing faction and began to recruit other officials, top officials in Guangxi, to oppose the appointment of Wei Guoqing. They thought that if they could get uh, his colleagues to denounce him, that they could convince Mao to let go of his support for him. Ultimately, ultimately we're really talking about uh, uh, a campaign to convince Mao to drop his support for Wei Guoqing. Um, and this opposition group became the April 22nd faction. And the head, this is a somewhat earlier photograph of Wu Jinan, but he had been uh, a top official in Guangxi going all the way back to 1955. In fact, he was appointed there before Wei Guoqing. He was also a veteran PLA commander. He's a Guangdu native. He comes from a county that makes me suspect that he, he is also Hakka, but they don't say anything about that in these documents. He was the second, pardon me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes, right. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> which is where Suyang is from, actually. Um, uh, he, yeah. Okay. Um, he's the second ranking. This man was the second ranking provincial official, okay? Uh, and he was convinced, he had to be convinced by these Beijing um, figures to form an opposition group. He was in, initially very reluctant to do so, but they said, no, don't worry about it. You know, if, if you oppose him, we've got your back. Um, and so uh, basically, I'm going to move quickly through the rest of the, the narrative here and just give you the, the big, um, the key points of the story. Uh, in May, early May of 1967, uh, Beijing called the, the leaders of these two factions to Beijing for negotiations. Uh, there are transcripts of about, I think, uh, 11 meetings with Zhou Enlai, and Zhou Enlai is constantly pleading with them. I mean, just the language is really interesting. Um, constantly pleading with them to remember the Vietnam War, to stop fighting. You guys like to fight? fine, we'll send you the front lines, and then you can know what fighting is really like. And he, he even uh, tries to negotiate um, standoffs at a key um, railway switching station that's blocking, has been blocking the shipment of troops and personnel back and forth. Um, the two factions during this period spread to every city and county. Okay, and I just want to talk briefly about that process because it unfolds if, if you, if you, um, simply record the dates of the overthrow of a local government, the first intervention by local military forces, usually the People's Armed Department, uh, and then the formation of factions. Uh, it, it shows you that this, there was a, a process whereby uh, the, the split in Nanning between these two factions became province-wide. So this solid line here is the, um, tracks the number of local, number of counties and cities that have overthrown their governments. And so that's about 80% of them. But you see, this is the first time that the military moves in to uh, seize control. And this is when they create alternative governments to manage, manage uh, production and so forth. For a long time, I, was, I, I, I thought it was curious that the army was so 
focused on managing the economy, then I realized it's not a market economy. And if the bureaucrats are not working, nothing gets delivered. It's a planned economy. Uh, so, um, and this is a spread of factions. And you can see that factions form um, with a slight delay from, you know, this is power seizures, military intervention. What this shows you is military intervention did not stop the formation of factions. Okay. So the same kind of thing that's happened in uh, in Nanning is happening in almost every city uh, and county. Uh, and this raises the question, well, who are the factions? And that raises the further question, who carried out power seizures? And if you look, and this is something I found nationwide in a, in a previous book, uh, in the cities, administrative cadres are a very small part of the urban labor force. In counties, they're a very large part of the uh, non-agricultural labor force. And so cadres are the group that's most, in a county, cadres are the group that's most seriously affected by the disorders in Guangxi because their jobs are on the line, okay? And they have to make the choice. And so who carried out power seizures? Uh, this is a broad alliance, uh, 12 of the 92 power seizures that are described are carried out by an alliance of workers, students, and cadres, just like Shanghai, right? That's the model. And this only happens in the big cities and in a few counties. This is a cadre-led coalition. By that, I mean that the descriptions in these accounts are ones where cadres uh, in the county government, party or government offices, decide to overthrow their superiors and they decide before doing so, we should invite a few students and workers to join us. But they're clearly leading it. Um, this is the, by far the most common time, kind, and that's cadres alone. They just seize power and they ignore everyone else. And these are also cadre power seizures, but they only seize power within their own offices. But they never get around to seizing power for the city, city or county uh, as a whole. So in other words, the, the power seizures in, in all of these localities are primarily carried out by counties. And the factions, the factions that emerge are cadres on different sides. And I'm gonna make a long story short. There, there, there are examples here. If you wanna talk about what they were fighting about, there's plenty of evidence in these materials about what the disputes were. But I'm gonna skip over this uh, for purposes of finishing uh, on time. But basically what happens is that the People's Armed Department usually is faced with cadres who seize power and other cadres who were left out of the power seizure but wanted to be part of it. So the cadres who weren't part of it uh, object and the local people's, the commander of the People's Armed Department has to make a choice. And whatever choice he makes, the group that he favors supports the People's Armed Department and they become the Allied Command. And the cadres whose claims were not, not credited by the People's Armed Department become uh, adherents of April 22nd. And so when the controversy between Wei Guoqing and Wu Jinan and Nanning breaks out, they take sides and align themselves with province-wide uh, province factions. That's a very, a very, uh, abbreviated version of that story. So uh, what's interesting about the negotiations is all the way up through August of 1967, it, the, the, the representatives from April 22nd who are in Beijing this entire time are being told by figures like Chi Ban Yu, Wang, Wang Li, that they're gonna win, that Mao's going to, they say, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Just tell us what you want, you're gonna win. Because we want, we want Wei Guoqing transferred to another province. <laughs> That's what we want. Um, and um, Xi Ban Yu said, okay, things look really good for you. This is August. Meanwhile, what's happening in China as a whole, not in Guangxi, but what's happening in China as a whole is there's, there's factional violence all over China. It's like Mao referred to this as all round civil war. Unfortunately for April 22nd, Mao got sick of this. This has to do with him being chased out of Wuhan after the Wuhan incident. I don't want to go into that right now. He goes to Shanghai, he rethinks how the Cultural Revolution is basically spiraling downward into a, a, a violence. And he decides, you know, these young guys in the Central Cultural Revolution group, they've, they've wrecked the Cultural Revolution. And, and he decides to purge Wang Li, Guan Feng, and Qi Ban Yu. 
These are the three people that supported the April 22nd faction. And he moves to, to support for all the military commanders that are throughout China. And he says, you guys create revolutionary committees. That means Wei Guoqing um, is appointed head of a preparatory committee. They have a big celebration in November uh, where Wei Guoqing is going to be the head of this new effort. It's clear he's going to be the remain as head of Guangxi's government and party. Uh, and uh, they send them all back to Nanning on an airplane and their celebrations and, and so forth on the airfield. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, this is exactly during the period when, where the U.S. escalation, the bombing on the border, reaches its highest levels. Um, and um, uh, not surprisingly, there's a, there's a huge flaw all throughout China in this strategy of sending, uh, sending the factions back under preparatory committees uh, and work out compromises because, uh, as you see in Guangxi, the parties that are designed, that are, that are intended to enforce the compromise are also parties to the conflict. What this means is the people's armed departments in the counties are the ones who are going to create a local revolutionary committee. So as soon as they get back in November, local uh, people's armed departments start cracking down on the April 22nd faction and reports of massacres start to filter back to Nanning. So the leadership of the April 22nd faction decides to rearm and to withdraw from the compromise that was hammered out in Beijing. And so for the first time in Guangxi in January, February 68, you get violent factional warfare. There's been very little up to that point in time. So if you look at the cumulative death rates uh, with the final result being 4.0 per uh, per thousand. Up through June of, of 1968, uh, Guangxi still wasn't very unusual. Still, its death rate was still below 2.0 2 per thousand. But all the killings occurred uh, after that date um, that pushed, pushed Guangxi's um, level of violence above other regions of China. So um, this is the abridged story. Um, that emerges from the narrative accounts. But we still haven't addressed the question of who carried out the rural killings, and that's a story I've told you, um, and who were the groups killed? Um, were the rural districts really isolated from urban factional conflicts? That's, that's the key uh, if you argue that it's intergroup violence that's spun out of control. Did community level hatred spin out of control? Did local ethnic composition affect death rates, and was the violence more severe in remote areas? So just to give you a bit of the statistical evidence, uh, this is a que the question here is whether there was factional conflicts in villages. Okay, remember, Suyong argued that, that the factional conflicts really were not relevant at all to what was happening in rural areas where the killings took place. Well, this, this tells us what percent of, this is within counties, okay, what percentage of the uh, events that are listed as factional conflicts occurred in urban versus rural areas. And you can see it's, it's almost, almost, relic, almost evenly divided. And if you look at the number of deaths, uh, more of the deaths occurred in rural areas. Than and events are defined as uh, events or uh, physical violence that led to death or any kind of- any, any kind of confrontation between these factions where these factions are named as the actors, okay? Um, events where the people's armed department or the militia are killing people are not included. Okay? So in other words, there's, there actually is quite a bit of activity uh, in villages. Uh, then we ask the question of, well, who were those people who were killed? Because one of the arguments, one of Suyang's arguments uh, is that almost everyone who was killed were um, people of these bad classes. Uh, and so there were 12,000 or so deaths where they named the people uh, who were killed. Uh, this is overall for uh, Guangxi as a whole. And the vast majority are members of the April faction. The question is, if you split cities and counties, cities is almost exclusively members of the April faction. But there's still the largest group that's named uh, in counties, okay? So that's, that raises the question of uh, 
within, within counties, again, this is the same thing I just showed you on the right here, the urban areas in counties, again, you see the same thing, many, a much higher percentages of those killed were in the April 22nd faction. So Su Young was right that, that factional conflict was much more common in urban areas. But there's still there's still a significant percentage, almost almost one third, one quarter of the people are named. So what the, this is masses. These people are not uh, identified. These are the people from the bad classes. Okay, and so you see that basically roughly equal numbers are identified from as members of factions uh, versus members of so-called bad class background households. And the crucial Final uh, piece of evidence is who carried out the killings. Uh, and there were 2,492 groups that were mentioned in these accounts, uh, and they accounted for 31,000 deaths. Uh, rural leaders, militia and security forces, the Revolutionary Committee, the Allied Faction, these are all authorities. That's 90% of the total. We put these together. Uh, all of the others who are mentioned, including a few April 22nd and other unidentified groups, only 10% uh, of the named um, perpetrators are not authority figures. So what about local characteristics? There's wide variation in death rates across counties and cities. Uh, and there's wide variation in the presence of minority populations in and of Hakka. Uh, and um, we can also ask whether the reach of the state affected death rates, were killings worse where party state control was weak uh, in, in the province. And so this is variation in local death rates. And you see there's enormous, ver enormous variation within the province as a whole with the darker, darker colors indicating higher death rates. Uh, and if you simply tabulate uh, where the deaths occurred within Guangxi, you see that half of the counties and cities had death rates that were no different than the rest of China, whereas the other half had death rates that were at least um, overall on the average were at least two or three times. Uh, more than uh, three quarters of all the deaths occurred in these, these two groups. So the, the killings were highly concentrated. And so this is a situation where we can, we can get a lot of statistical leverage over figuring out uh, what might have been responsible. This is the distribution of the minority population. This, this, this fits with uh, historic migration patterns where, where Han Chinese speaking migrants moved in from, uh, from Hunan primarily and pushed the minority groups to the West uh, towards, towards Yunnan. Uh, and it, it turns out there really aren't very many Hakka in Guangxi. Whatever Suyang wanted to say about Guangdong, there really weren't enough Hakka in Guangxi to make much difference. The interesting wrinkle here is that these, these uh, counties here were part of Guangdong until 1958. And these were part of the areas where you had Hakka Bundi Wars in the 19th century. Okay. Now, um, uh, we also... Um, see that uh, because uh, after, um, let's say, death rates were highly related to, uh, correlated with the formation of a, of a revolutionary committee. I'm not gonna show you a graph, but in the month before revolutionary committee was formed, a locality had a spike in deaths, which shows that repression started. Uh, but then there was another spike in August after the July 3rd, uh, July and August after the July 3rd order. And so if you look at the average death rate, the later that a revolutionary committee was formed, the higher the death rates. And so the ones that were the last group had death rates more than twice as high uh, as other regions. So we're getting near the end here. So what should we observe in, in the data if, if the argument, if the story that I've told based on the narratives is, is accurate, okay? Well, uh, for intergroup conflict, uh, since massacres were thought to have spun out of control, the death rates should be higher in geographically or politically remote regions where the party couldn't stop all these things that it did not want to happen. Uh, this would be along provincial borders. It would be places that had fewer cadres per capita, where the state was less well um, staffed. 
Uh, if it was a counterinsurgency campaign, which is, which is what I believe we're seeing here, death rates should not be higher in remote regions. They should be the same or even lower in those same regions. And if it was a counterinsurgency campaign, the death rates should be higher where revolutionary committees were established later. In other words, where the fighting went on for longer, the death rates in the end, the repression in the end was more violent. So um, I won't show you my regression <laughs> table, but I'll show you the results. Uh, there was no net, net impact on local death rates uh, for the presence of mixed, uh, ethnically mixed localities. I tried many, many different specifications. If you're, if you're into this sort of thing, we can talk about it in the question and answer period. Uh, Hakka population had no effect whatsoever. Um, distance from the prefectural capital had no effect whatsoever. This was something that uh, Suyang found in his, his data. Uh, and the number of local party members, again, various specifications, had no effect one way or the other. But these things did. And these are really control variables. Uh, this is just the size of the population. So the larger the population, for every 100,000 in population, you had a 20% higher death rate. Uh, for every 10,000 of urban population, more urban regions, at somewhat lower death rates, 5%. Um, for every 1,000 cadres per capita, you had a 27% higher death rate. Okay? In other words, the localities that where the party state was stronger killed more people. Okay? And if you're in a border region, your death rates were 48% lower. So these places that historically were remote, um, not very accessible, they killed fewer people. And uh, for every month after January of 1968 that your revolutionary committee was formed, your death rates increased by 17%. Okay, so it was, it was <laughs> uh, and so um, it's very rare when you do statistical <laughs> analysis for the results to be so much in, I mean, I, I was suspicious of this because usually, it's, it's, you don't get clear results like this. And I begin in particular to worry about this. This is huge. <laughs> this is huge. So I thought, well, what could possibly be spurious about this? And I think there's one very obvious uh, answer to that. And that is that when the investigators were sent down, they either didn't want to go to the remote regions. Think about the county guest houses in these, places, these really poor places. Or if they went there, they didn't want to stay very long because life was difficult there, or the archives were not as good in these places. So I would take this with, with a grain of salt, but what we do know, it should have been positive in the other direction for the other argument. So even if this completely disappears, my guess is there's something to this, but this is really a, just a huge, implausibly huge in the direction of my argument. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> I devote a little, little bit of space to what's that. So th this is the last slide. So why Guangxi? Um, the Guangxi massacres were not genocidal intergroup violence like Rwanda, Partition Era, India, or Bosnia. So, um, my student, Su Yang, is, is an excellent scholar, and his, his, his book really helped me focus these questions, because I don't know what I would have asked if it weren't for his, his uh, work. I think he read too much on genocide before he wrote <laughs> of this book. Uh, and, and, I, and I have to say that his, his argument, his analysis is sociological in ways that mine isn't, right? His is very consistent with sociological theory, group theory. Mine is not, <laughs> okay? Um, the killings of bad classes, he was right about one thing, the killings of bad class households uh, did push Guangxi's death rates above the rest of China. Half of the people, roughly half of the people, that were identified were members of these bad class households. But the reason they were killed was in regions where they didn't look, in, in rural areas where they did not have April 22nd factions, they went after the bad class people because the, um, the authorities had told Beijing and told themselves that what they were fighting against in the April 22nd faction uh, was a, a province-wide underground movement by anti-communist elements linked to the former exploiting classes. And, and that's so when they did couldn't find April 22nd people, 
they went after the members of the black class households. Uh, almost every case of cannibalism or sexual violence, which I haven't really talked about, it's one of the more depressing and widespread things in this, this story. Um, almost every case it, uh, that's described in these materials are victimizing bad class households. Okay. Uh, the killings were directed. I, I've kind of left out a lot of the narrative here about how the authorities mobilized local militia to carry them out. There are many cases where, where the People's Armed Department of the county points to a district, uh, a real district, and said, you guys aren't killing enough people. And if you're afraid to do it, send them to us and we'll kill them. Uh, and this happened in a number, number of areas. They really had to mobilize these local militia to do this job. Um, in other words, it was the local militia that spun out of control. It wasn't local ordinary population. Um, Guangxi, in other words, was a counterinsurgency campaign that looks very much like the Indonesian massacres of communists and leftists in 1966, uh, which was a systematic extermination of political opponents organized by the Indonesian army after a coup attempt that led to the death of several generals. And so what the army did, it went into villages in, in Indonesia and mobilized uh, local political parties, nationalists and Islamic political parties to go after their long-standing rivals in the communist and leftist political parties. Uh, that's what it looks like in Guangxi, but the tragic part is that the differences, that political differences were not real in the sense that they were long-standing cleavages in the existing population. Uh, and that's really the tragedy that you see uh, in the violence and the cultural revolution as a whole. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, if you can stay there, okay. Andy, because we've got a number of people online.